To avoid unwanted YouTube ads, we encourage you to watch this video via the link in the video description below. Good morning. Welcome to Awake Us Now. I'm Pastor Dodge, and on behalf of all of us here at Awake, I'd just like to rejoice that you've joined us here today and pray that today's message and worship will be a true blessing to each and every one of us. We have been taking a look at the letter of James, the epistle of James. One of the things James tells us at the very outset is this, every good and perfect gift comes down from above from the Father of heavenly lights. And what James is getting at is that God is the giver of every good thing. Everything we have, our lives, our possessions, and most importantly, our relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ, it comes down as a gift from heaven. It's important that we remember that. Because especially in our culture today, it is very easy to become self-centered and assume that everything revolves around us. In reality, we are the creation of a good and gracious and perfect God. And his desire is that we experience a living relationship with him through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is my prayer for each and every one of us. And I pray that today, as we tackle a rather sensitive subject with James, I pray that each of us will be encouraged, corrected where necessary, and above all, drawn even closer to the living God. Let's start with prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning expectant. We know your word is powerful. We know that your desire for us is good. And so we pray this day that you would speak into each of our hearts. We pray that you would draw us closer to yourself through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that you would open our eyes to see what truly matters, what is really valuable forever, and pray that your word would truly find, find a welcome place in our hearts and be received with thanksgiving. Amen. Well, today we're going to continue taking a look at the letter written by James, the half-brother of Jesus, what is possibly one of the earliest if not the earliest letter in the entire New Testament. We're going to be looking at a short section from James chapter 5, verses 1 to 6. And the title of today's message is A Word to the Wealthy. I think it's very important from the very outset that we describe what the Bible says about wealth. What the scriptures teach is that wealth, money, whatever commodity it may be, is morally neutral where morality comes in is around two questions. How do we acquire that wealth and how do we use it? James addresses those very issues in his letter. If you've been with us over these last weeks, you know this is not the first time that James has talked about wealth. And I think it's important for us to go back and just quickly review what James has addressed in this powerful letter to early believers, Jewish believers in Jesus, who have been forced out of Jerusalem because of the persecution that came after the death of Stephen, the first martyr in the Christian community. James has told us the following in chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. He reminds those who have limited resources that they are to rejoice in the tremendous resource God has given us through faith in the Lord Jesus. But then he also reminds those who are wealthy that they are not to take pride in their wealth. Rather, they are to be humble because what they have will not endure. It will ultimately rot and rust, and all of us will face the final judgment before the Heavenly Father. James calls wealthy believers to humility before God and others. In James 2, verses 1 to 9, James addressed the whole question of favoritism and the importance of receiving all people, rich and poor alike, not, not playing favorites, not cozying up to those who have more, but rather treating everyone with the kind of humble graciousness that is ours through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. In James chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, James reminds his readers and hearers how deadly those kind of greedy quarrels can be. 
how we want what someone else has and how it leads us on a path that is destructive to our relationship with God and our relationship with others. And James gives clear direction how believers are to behave. And then finally, in James 4, verses 13 to 17, which we looked at last week, James addresses the whole question of planning. And he addresses a very real issue. Individuals who were saying, hey, I think I'm going to move to such and such a city because I can make lots of money there. Now, the Bible does not say that money is evil. What the Bible does say is that we are to seek God's will in everything that we do. And that is how James addresses his fellow brothers and sisters in Jesus the Messiah. Now we come to a different section a section that truly is different from what has preceded it. In every one of these four cases, James is speaking to believers, and he's giving clear direction from the Scripture, from the Holy Spirit, from the teachings of Jesus. But now in chapter 5, verses 1 to 6, we see something that is no longer directed to believers. In fact, what it is, is an apostrophe. And by the way, I I know the word apostrophe in English is usually thought of as a punctuation mark, but it's also the description of an ancient technique for addressing people who are not there. (laughs) And and what an apostrophe is, it is a um, basically a rebuke of people who are not part of the community. What James is talking about here in the opening verses of chapter 5 is not how believers are to behave. He is instead addressing his remarks to those who have rejected the gospel of Jesus and who have persecuted these early believers. It is important for us to keep that in mind because it is all too easy to take these words out of their context and simply turn it into a screed against anyone who is wealthy. Frankly, in our culture today, wealthy is often defined as anyone who has more than I do. And James does not fall into that trap. Instead, what he is doing here is he is reminding his hearers of those who are opposing them. And it is only in the verses that follow, which we'll be looking at next week, that he gives believers encouragement and direction. So with that in mind, let's take a look at James chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. James says, now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Now, all along, James has encouraged wealthy believers. Here he is not talking to believers. In fact, as it will become very evident, he is addressing these words to the very people who crucified Jesus. And if we look carefully at what James says, I believe that's going to become very obvious to each of us. James goes on, he says, your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. When James says that, he's hearkening back to words of Jesus himself. In his great sermon on the mount, Jesus talked about those things which perish, which are eaten by moths. Listen to these words from Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 21, as Jesus speaks about the nature of wealth that perishes. He says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. James is addressing these words to people whose hearts are far away from the Lord Jesus. These words are addressed to people who have attacked the early believers, who've driven them from their homes and from their communities. And James reminds them that there is a judgment that awaits those who reject and ignore the grace of God. James's words are very, very pointed. He says in verse 3, your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. What James is saying is the very things that you have longed for and yearned and value most highly, those things are going to be taken away from you at the end. And then James says, look, The wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. 
The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. And in fact, James uses a very interesting construction here. Uh, the words translated Lord Almighty in Greek are Kyrios Sabaoth, or Lord of Sabaoth, or Lord of hosts, Lord of heaven's armies. James is saying, you're going to have to give an account to the living God. Now, who are these people who have failed to pay their workers? One of the things that we know from the records that have survived from first century Israel is that there were many who were extremely wealthy. They held the highest positions in the land, the high priesthood and its offices, and they were unscrupulous. It was widely recognized in the day. In fact, the Jewish historian Josephus tells us that one of those high priests in particular, he mentions a very specific incident where Ananias, the, the man who had ordered the apostle Paul to be slapped in the face, Ananias sent some of his own people into the very temple of God where the tithes were kept and took the money and the gifts that were intended for the priests and used it basically for his own political purposes. The result, Josephus tells us, is that many of the poorer priests actually starved to death because their wages had been taken away. What James is referring to is real life instances. And he's making it very clear that these individuals, the rich that he addresses, are individuals who have opposed the people of God and who are against everything that the Bible has taught, even though they, on the surface, appear to be religious. And so James wraps it up by saying, you have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You've fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. And then he ties it together with this final word. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. What is that talking about? Today, there's all sorts of speculation, but I can tell you this, the earliest believers who have left written records tell us how they interpreted this in the first decades of the Christian era. They interpreted this as referring to none other than Jesus himself, the innocent one. The, the Greek term that James uses here is literally the righteous one. It is the same term that is used in the book of Acts chapter 7 when the earliest Christian martyr, Stephen, spoke against the high priests and those who had basically schemed against Jesus and railroaded him to the cross. Here's what Stephen said, Acts 7 verse 52. He spoke to them and he said, was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. It's a term for the Messiah, and that's the term that James is using here. And then Stephen goes on, and now you have betrayed and murdered him. Stephen accuses the high priests and their minions of murdering the righteous one, the Messiah. And now James uses that same term, the righteous one, to talk about one who was murdered by these individuals, even though he was not opposing them or resisting them would be another translation. What James is talking about, I believe, in light of the context of scripture, the context of this letter, and the actual meaning of the language and words that he uses. James is saying these rich people are the very ones who killed the Lord Jesus Christ, who ordered him, sent to Pilate, and who were plotting his death all along. These are the people that James is attacking as he speaks about the rich. Now, at that point, it would be very easy for us to say, Phew, this doesn't apply to me. <laughs> but that's just not the case. Because you see, all along, James has been addressing the issue of wealth. And he is reminding believers 2,000 years ago and today how God desires the wealth that comes from above to be used by his people. 
And so I'd like to conclude this morning by taking a look at the clear teaching of Scripture in regards to the proper use of wealth. Here are the things that the Bible says in a nutshell. First of all, the Bible warns us that although every good and perfect gift comes from above, that wealth is from God himself, the pursuit of wealth leads to idolatry. Now, don't get me wrong. There have been many wealthy, godly people. In fact, the Bible is full of them. Abraham was wealthy. Isaac was wealthy. Jacob was wealthy. Even Joseph, who was betrayed by his own brothers, ended up being incredibly powerful and wealthy in Egypt. David was wealthy. We see example after example of godly men and women who really were wealthy. In fact, in the Gospel of Luke, Luke tells us in Luke chapter 8 that there were a number of godly women who used their own resources to support the ministry of Jesus. They were well off and they made sure that he was able to pursue the work the Father had given him to do. Even the man who buried Jesus was wealthy. Joseph of Arimathea. There are lots of good wealthy people in the Bible, but wealth can be misused very easily. I think of the classic example there one who was very greedy for wealth. His name? Judas, who would ultimately betray Jesus. And so the scriptures are quite clear that while wealth is morally neutral, the pursuit of wealth can easily lead to idolatry. Here is the way Jesus expressed it in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Jesus said the following. He said, No one can serve two masters, Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The danger of wealth, the improper pursuit of wealth, is that it takes our eyes off of what matters most and sets up false gods in our lives. And so the scriptures are very clear in warning that. And, and by the way, it's not just Jesus who says that, although that's enough. <laughs> but the Apostle Paul says something very similar. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. This is what the Apostle Paul writes. He says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed which is idolatry. Isn't that interesting? The Apostle Paul talks about illicit sex. He talks about impure behavior. He talks about lust. He talks about evil desires. But when he gets to greed, which is so prevalent in the human race, when he gets to greed, he says that is idolatry. And so the scriptures are warning us not to pursue wealth for wealth's sake. Money is morally neutral. The pursuit of money is deadly and dangerous. And so the scriptures also remind us that the wealthy are to be humble and generous. By the way, all believers are to be humble and generous, but particularly those who have been blessed with wealth by God. They are not to take that wealth as something strictly for their own use. They are to be generous people who are humble before God and humble before others. Once again, listen to what the Apostle Paul has to say about that. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, the Apostle Paul addresses the whole issue of wealth and money. And he speaks very directly to the people of his day and our day. This is what he writes in 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning at verse 17. Paul says, command those who are rich... Now note that, command those, command those who are rich in the present world. Maybe you're saying to yourself, well, I'm not rich. I will say this, dear friends, that compared to the average first century individual, almost everyone in America today and in the Western world is rich by comparison. So we can't just skirt away from that. What he says is, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, 
but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so they may take hold of the life that is truly life. What Paul is saying is, wealth is a gift from God, and it is to be used wisely as God's servants and as stewards of what he has given. We are to be humble. We are to be generous. And that is not an option. You will notice the Apostle Paul says, command them. And again, command them. This is important. Again, James has said the same thing. Remember, we read that early on in the epistle of James. James 1, verses 10 and 11. But the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossoms fall and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. We're called to be humble before God and to use what he has given wisely to help others to further the message of Jesus, to usher in the kingdom of God as in heaven so also on the earth. Number three, the scriptures say that godliness with contentment is gain. I'll ask you the question, are you content today? You know, in the almost 50 years that Jan and I have been married, we have experienced wealth and poverty. <laughs> we have experience with both. God, who is gracious, has brought us through both of those things. And it is important, whatever our situation in life, to be content. I remember times when we didn't know where the next meal was coming from. But I also remember how good God was and how we can rely upon him, even in those most difficult situations. And so the Apostle Paul speaks about this again in 1 Timothy chapter 6. And this is what he says in verses 7 and 8. I'm going to actually start at verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. What the apostle is telling us is, whatever our situation in life, we are to find our ultimate strength and meaning in God himself. Rich and poor alike can easily be, be diverted from their God-assigned mission by the pursuit of wealth. And what the scripture is saying is that we are called to rest in God, to rest in our Lord Jesus Christ, who's given us everything, and to be content in the midst of whatever circumstance we find ourselves, because our strength is in God and in him alone. The scriptures also remind us that the love of money is a temptation and a trap. And again, the scriptures are very clear and straightforward on that. The apostle Paul writes, and he says, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Throughout history, we have seen how the love of money can destroy individuals, families, communities, and nations. One of the classic examples from the Bible is one of the richest men who ever lived. A man who was commended in his early days because he was seeking wisdom from God and seeking to be a servant. But in the end, he fell prey to riches and his own lust. His name was Solomon. And the nation was plunged into civil war because he turned from God to stuff and to things. The love of money, Paul says, is a temptation 
and a trap. And finally, the scriptures remind us that the pursuit of wealth can destroy faith. Here is the way the Apostle Paul ends this section in verse 10. He says, some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. The Apostle knew even in those earliest days of the Jesus movement, how corrupting wealth can be. The love of money can destroy. I believe those words are especially important for us to hear, particularly in a culture that admires wealth, a culture that seeks it in any way possible, a culture that values people on the basis of how successful they are and how much they possess. When a culture gets to that point, even God's people can easily be seduced and deceived. And so the scriptures are very clear to us. We have been bought with a price, and the price is the blood of the Son of God who gave himself for us all. Whatever our situation in life, whether rich or poor, whether just starting out or coming to the end of our lives, our call is to be focused on him who loved us and gave his son for us, who has poured out his Holy Spirit upon us, and who calls us to be salt and light in a corrupt and decaying culture. These words of James are not simply words directed to the enemies of the people of God. They have great application for all of us as we consider what God himself tells us about wealth. I pray that each of us will be blessed by these words, encouraged, corrected where necessary, and above all else, driven into the loving arms of our Savior, who desires to take everything that he has given us and use it for God's glory, for our good, and for the benefit of all those around us. May the Lord grant that in your life and in mine, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we yield ourselves to you. With the old hymn writer, we save say, take my silver and my gold, not a mite with I would hold. We yield ourselves to you. And we pray, Father, that you use us to bring the message of Jesus to all those around us and to those around the world. Amen. Well, let's talk about these things, shall we? For discussion. First of all, money is morally neutral. How would you describe the proper use of wealth? Do you struggle with the pursuit of riches? Are you content? And finally, what are the scriptures and the Holy Spirit saying to you? What is God placing on your heart? How does his word resonate in your spirit and in your mind? What is the Holy Spirit guiding and directing you this day? What is he desiring of you? I believe those are things that all of us need to seek regularly.